Welcome to another MESA 2021. Today's presentation is about equipment as a service. My name is Morgan Zimmerman. I am the CEO of the NetVibes brand at Dassault System. I am here today with my colleague, Josefina Sonerup, that is our expert for after-service sales. Today, we will get you through what we call equipment as a service. So, Josefina, can you tell us what equipment as a service stands for? Well, 10 years ago, OEMs mainly focused on product selling only. And in this one-time sell approach, the after-sales service was outside their concern because it was often maintained by the user itself or the local service provider. And then they realized that service actually generates a much higher margin than new equipment sales. So they saw this as an additional revenue opportunity and started to offer service contract for the equipment that they're sold, but also for the equipment that their competitors sold. And now we see this trend uh, of leasing coming from the transportation and mobility industry, popping up also in industrial equipment industry. And this is when you subscribe rather by the uh, product one time. Now we're looking towards the next generation of selling product as a service, which is the experience selling. And this is where you pay for product performance or outcome rather than time accessing of the product. And uh, this could be anything such as uh, how many kilometers you're driven or uh, how many produced goods per hour your machine made or the running hours of your elevator. There is no limitation of what KPIs you might sell, but the difference between leasing and the other business model is that the user is no longer paying for a non-running machine, meaning that every non-running minute is an unpaid minute. A simple example of that, 10 years ago, I bought a car. When it broke, I tried to fix it myself, but with no luck, I ended up paying an overprice to the local service provider. Five years later, I bought a new car, and now I'm not allowed to try to fix it myself anymore. I wonder why. And also, I need to go to a specific service provider to get it fixed. That is belonging to the owner of, that is the owner of the car manufacturing company. Now I uh, don't want to owe a car anymore, so I leased one instead. And the cost of service is the least of my problem. And in the future, I will not lease a car because it will already be leased by my Uber driver. And I will simply pay to get from point A to B. So that is how the business model is evolving with time. And the ones that will not adapt to this change will in time start to vanish. So time is really changing and fast. So products is going towards product as a service, product sales towards experience sales, after sales towards continuous sales, paid by unit towards paid by outcome and ownership towards usership. But today we are not there yet. Today we see the two of these business models appearing in the annual report of our customers. So either one by one or the merge of the two, where you offer the equipment to a lower fixed price and you add a variable on top based on product outcome. And what is interesting comparing these two business models is the shift in focus. So what was before the highest priority, delivering high configured products to a mass production price with a short lead time, is now replaced by sustainable design that is made to be efficiently serviced, upgraded and recycled. So that, Morgan, in a nutshell, is equipment as a service. Thank you very much, Josefina. That was very clear. So let me check my understanding. If I simplify, there are three categories of business model. Product and service selling, where equipment failures means more service revenues, at least after the end of the warranty period. Connected product experience, where customer experience becomes at the core of everything and margins gets enhanced by continuous optimization of every day's decisions. And finally, equipment as a service, where the business model profitability is completely reinvented based on the actual performance of the product and performance of the operations while maximizing usage and customer value. My understanding is that the connected product experience is a must go through steps because you need to learn from here 
so that you don't get into equipment as a service completely blinded. By the way, there is an interesting positive side effect to all of this exercise, which is that we are massively improving our footprint and indeed having profitable sustainability impact for our planet. You also said that this is a transformation journey. And I think to understand the transformation journey, it's interesting to look at whom are the players in each of these three business models. Product and service selling, you have a single organization in charge, which is a service organization. It can be an independent organization, in most cases, as you said, very profitable. Connected product experience requires to connect engineering, quality, and service together. But if you go into equipment as a service, then you need to connect the entire company, from the CEO to the CFO to service and quality. The challenges are different. To go into connected product experience, you need to connect and leverage all of the available data. IoT data, pictures, uh, movies, history of uh, equipment failures, all of that data needs to be leverageable so that you can actually start doing predictive maintenance as an example. When you go into equipment as a service, the challenge starts to be different. You need to reinvent how people are working within your organization. You need to reinvent the complete interaction mechanism to go from an idea to a decision from the CEO to the field technicians. So indeed, now it has become an enterprise collaboration topic. Josefina, it would be great if you could try to put some images to illustrate these three categories. An elevator has stopped because of an unknown error. This is Lisa. She's working as a service agent at the elevator company. So she reports the customer call and the issue. Then she will schedule an intervention in order to go and have a look at the broken elevator. This is Steve. He's a service technician and works also at the elevator company. He's now on his way to the site. On the site, he can see what part that is causing the problem, but he doesn't know what part number to order because every elevator is unique in its configuration. So he takes some photos and try to describe the parts that he see. Then he leaves for his next intervention. So this is Susan. She's a service leader and she receives the order request from Steve. She looks at the picture and the description that he made, but this is far from what she needs in order to identify the correct part. So she needs to send Steve back to site. So Lisa calls the customer once again to schedule a new intervention. And according to the schedule of Steve and the customer, a new intervention is scheduled and Steve is on its way back to the customer. On site, he takes more photos to better describe the part and then he leaves for his next intervention. Susan now thinks that she got what she need in order to identify a part and the part is being ordered. Now there is a lead time of three weeks and Lisa is contacting the customer once again to schedule a new intervention. Once the intervention is scheduled, Steve is on his way again with the ordered part three weeks later. On site, he tries to fix the problem, but it seems that it wasn't the good part, so it didn't fit and the work needs to be cancelled. So Susan now takes some help from the part specialist, Rob. Rob identifies the part, um, which is not the same that was identified before. A new part is ordered and then there is another waiting time of three weeks. Lisa contacts the customer once again to schedule the second repair. And three weeks later, when the parts arrived, Steve is on his way once again to the site. Now, hopefully, he will try to fix the elevator, and it seems that this time it was a good part. So after seven weeks and 22 working hours for intervention and with the help of four employees, the elevator is finally back to operation. We will now illustrate how the same situation could have been sold with the same business model, but with the help of connected product experience. So in the virtual experience, you can start imagine the service even before it actually happens. By collecting field data from earlier service event, we can calculate the average value of when certain parts will break. 
This is called mean time between failure. And the replacement time is called mean time to repair. So the service parts carry its own service frequency, but also other information such as its lead time. All the process can be optimized in advance by simulating the disassembly path, by assuring maintainability, and also creating comprehensive 3D work instruction to guide the service technician. The virtual experience will now meet the real world. And with the real-time data for a certain specific elevator, Susan can see that there is an upcoming failure predicted in six weeks. This gives her time to act before the original part actually breaks. She can then remotely identify the right spare part order or the right spare part number thanks to the virtual twin. She also checks that there is no intervention planned in the coming weeks to replace the part. When she has done that, she can order the part and the three weeks of lead time is not really a problem because the original part is still running and it will not break until six weeks. So in the meantime, we can optimize and schedule the intervention based on the availability, the travel time of Steve and of course also the customer. The part has now arrived and Steve is on his way to the customer to the replace the part. And the spare part that he has with him now actually fits. So after only five hours of downtime, five and a half hours of working time, one intervention and only by the help of Susan and Steve, the elevator is now back to operating. So Morgan, after seeing these two scenarios, what do you think? What is your thoughts? Thank you very much, Josefina. Indeed, your scenarios were very clear. The first scenario, product and service selling, may be seen as a bit of a caricature uh, for some of you. But for other people in the room, it may look as a real life. Even so, I would probably expect that you would not admit it. It is a reality. It sometimes takes multiple weeks to solve a simple problem while burning significant resources and devastating the customer relationship. In your second scenario, connected product experience, welcome to the new world. The customer is at the core of everything where any single new issue is becoming a trigger for continuous improvement, where margin is enhanced thanks to performance and efficiency levels. Let's go to uh, now the third topic. To go to equipment as a service at Dassault System, we could have selected, you know, a customer stories like what you have just seen. Or we could have decided to show you all of the technology enablers that are critical to sustain equipment as a service. AR, VR, prescriptive maintenance, uh, optimization algorithms. But I don't think this is a topic. As we said earlier, to go to equipment as a service, it's about operating a significant transformation within your organization. It's about reinventing the way uh, you, the CEO, the CFOs, the service organization are interacting together. It's about reinventing the convention of decisions and the convention of interaction with your entire partner network. To demonstrate that, uh, I'm going to do something outside of the manufacturing space. And I hope you will forgive me for that. I would like to show you how a collaboration platform is capable of transforming the way people are interacting through a crisis. And I selected the COVID-19 crisis. And I selected organizations that typically don't work very well together, public authorities. So I'm going to show you how with a collaboration platform we've been able to change the way multiple public authorities across a regional network have changed the way they work together to manage the crisis and minimize impact for the population. So topic number one uh, is we have rebuilt a virtual twin of the region. And on that region, we are aggregating all of the relevant data to understand what's happening either on the health standpoint sanitary standpoint, uh, hospital saturation, economical standpoint, and on multi-scale, looking at the entire region or down to a small neighborhood. On top of that, we are applying a set of predictive model, epidemiologic model, to measure, anticipate the impact of decisions such as confinement or deconfinement scenarios. 
you could compare that as a, it's a preventive maintenance model for human population. With that, we are empowering the local network of actors, the hospitals, the mayors, the regions, to take the most optimum local decisions. Should we open that school? Uh, should we uh, replan some oper operating procedures at the hospitals? And by doing that, we are securing that while going through these complex crises, uh, all of the decisions are made to minimize the impact for the population. The reason why I wanted to take this example with you is I wanted to show you that if we can do at the scale of a government, uh, change the way these administrations are working together to take both very short-term or longer-term decisions to optimize impact uh, on such a sophisticated problem as COVID-19, definitely we can use the same types of approach and methodology to drive business model transformation at the scale of your company, with including all of your business groups, or your entire value network, including your customers and your suppliers. So as a conclusion, uh, Josefina, you have demonstrated that to improve efficiency of service operation, to secure customer satisfaction while improving margin, you need virtual twin experience of the product, which allows to reveal and interpret with efficiency all of the real world data. In the last session, we revealed that to sustain enterprise transformation, it is about reinventing the working together, the interaction convention, the decision convention across the entire company network. This is why at Dassault System, we have empowered our 3D experience platform with three engines. A science engine for modeling and simulation, a data science engine to reveal and interpret all of the real world data signals, a collaboration engine to instrument and execute together across the entire network. This is what we call virtual experience twin. It can transform how equipment is being serviced today and trigger new business models, such as equipment as a service, in the short and the longer future. Timing is up to you. Thank you very much. Merci à toi. <laughs>